Okay. Um, yeah, the audio is going now. Okay. Okay. <clears throat> All right. Okay. So, thanks. Okay. <clears throat> that was quick. Okay. Um, great. So uh, welcome back. Um, I have the short shock this time, so hopefully it won't squeak so much. Um, so um, yeah. So then that last little section from from me, I kind of went on for a little, a lot, kind of from the physicist's point of view, but try you know trying to. Uh, uh, talk about the the role of probabilistic modeling for the data and the fact that there are these you know very different approaches that are out there from things that are driven more from the simulation side to some kind of uh, uh, convenient uh, uh, convenient models for the data like simple polynomials and things like that um, one thing that I should have said which I, <clears throat> is it, even in those situations where people uh, for instance uh, in the search for the uh, Higgs to two photons, the way that the background was modeled was just a simple, say, falling exponential or polynomial. That's not what we think the true, you know, the true scattering process involves. You know that the true scattering process is going to involve, you know, uh, uh, parton density functions and things that have to do with masses of various particles. It's not going to just look like a simple exponential. Um, however, you can uh, use uh, simulated data and then try to validate those simple models, like the simple polynomials and exponentials to simulated data. And if you can convince yourself that that simple description describes the data well enough, then you can be kind of comfortable. Uh, but it does have this sort of two-stage process associated to it of a kind of first principles physical uh, forward model of what's going on to this kind of uh, adopting a simple statistical model. Um, Another thing that's maybe worth saying, because my goal in this hour uh, and, and a bit is now to try to make a bit of a connection to what I was saying and some of the things that uh, Gilles was doing. Um, so it, Gilles presented, for instance, uh, this linear discriminant analysis with the, when the uh, data are both sampled from, uh, you know, look like a, a Gaussian, basically, with the same covariance. And that's a very restricted uh, kind of setting, right? I mean, the data might not look like a Gaussian, and the idea that the two classes both have a, you know, the same covariance is, is restrictive. <clears throat> In the case of the logistic regression, it was some of those assumptions were relaxed, but there's still quite a few, um, you, know, you, uh, you know, assumptions, if you will. So I think that that kind of gets back to this idea that I had mentioned at the very beginning, that when I saw some of the first things with machine learning, it was always, it looked kind of... Uh, like that doesn't look like a physics problem, so maybe none of this is is uh, is relevant, right? So there's a there's a another attitude which is that uh, um, that you're not necessarily that the true data has that distribution, but that's just basically going to be your tool to try to analyze the data, and then as long as you can characterize it, uh, you would be able to move forward. So for instance, he Jill had the example of the blue dots and the red dots where they clearly weren't drawn from the same you know, they didn't both have the same covariance, and that gives you some sort of, you know, discriminator or classifier. Um, you can still characterize that classifier and how well it works. Um, and so there's, at some point, there will be this distinction between a model that you're using for whatever your task is, which might not be, you know, might not really describe the true data, um, and then this idea of how well you can characterize it or calibrate its performance. And so you can still feel comfortable kind of moving forward as a scientist using a model even if it's not, uh, uh, but so in that in that language, uh, it, it's not optimal. It's not the optimal discriminator, but it would still be um, sort of you still find to use as long as you can characterize it. So, um, but <clears throat> to try to like make that a little bit more clear, I just wanted to sort of follow up some of the things that uh, Jules said, and then uh, then try to connect it back to what we had talked about. So, um, one is just a notational issue, just to make sure. Uh, that we're all on the same page. Uh, so Jill wrote several times things that look uh, like uh, like like this uh, x uh, coming from some uh, uh, an expectation where the data x is say drawn from 
uh, uh, some distribution, and then uh, brackets with some function f of x inside. So this kind of notation, just to make sure that we're all on the same page, that you know what this means is uh, is that you're integrating uh, p of x. So that's what's written here is is this is the measure that you're doing this integration, and then this is the integrand that you're kind of uh, that you care about doing uh, dx, right? So this is that's what's meant by this notation, okay? Um, and then. Uh, and as we talked about before, this kind of um, integral can be approximated with the Monte Carlo integral that looks like a sum uh, from, you know, uh, from i equals, you know, 1 to n of, uh, of f of xi when the, when the xi's are drawn a source, uh, uh, according to p of x. Does this make sense? So if you have some, um, so, you know, if... If uh, here's x and p of x is some, <clears throat> and then uh, and then you have some other function that you that you care about, you know this could be uh, the the f of x. Um, you draw samples according to p of x, and then you just evaluate f of x many times and take the the average, and you're, that's this Monte Carlo approximation. So uh, so one of the formulas like this that Gilles had was this f was a loss function, that expectation uh, of the loss function is what was called the, the expected risk. And then the kind of uh, the empirical estimate, uh, the empirical risk, you can just see as a, the Monte Carlo uh, approximation of this true integral. But one of the things that's interesting about it is that, um, is that if you think about, <coughs> excuse me, uh, X's being, for instance, pictures of cats. Um, I don't know what the distribution for, you know, cat pictures looks like, but I can just have a bunch of pictures of cats, right? And you can think of the bunch of pictures of cats as sampling from some, you know, some distribution of cat images, right? So, um, so that's, so to me, a lot of what's going on in machine learning is to try to, uh, uh, try to express the problem that you want to solve as minimizing you know, as, as some sort of, you know, loss function. Uh, you need to find a loss function such that when you find uh, the, uh, uh, you know, the quantity that solves it, uh, that it, it does what you want, and that you can then, uh, and is, if the loss function, you know, or the risk is written out in an integral of a form like this, then you can approximate it with samples of data, right? So, uh, so it, it so the, in that sense, like machine learning, if you're thinking of it from the point of view that you're trying to solve it on empirical data, it's almost always useful to think about whatever is providing you the data, that there's some underlying distribution that you don't know, but then you can manipulate it symbolically like you did know it, and it kind of helps clarify your, your thinking of what's going on. Um, so, um, um, yeah, so this is just kind of, in general, some notation. So, for instance, when he wrote uh, the risk uh, for uh, uh, some function f. Um, this was an expectation now of both of x and y being drawn from a joint distribution. So this is uh, describing x and y uh, simultaneously, and then he had a, a loss function of uh, y and uh, f of x, right? So this was his, his uh, the, this is the expected risk, and this was some loss function, and you had this expectation. Um, so this, this is kind of an interesting thing to think about, because this is saying um, you're, you're the joint distribution of, say, images and the label cat or dog, right? Or you could, you know, so Y would be like a label telling you it's a cat image or a dog image, and X is what the image itself looks like. Um, and uh, in, in uh, physics language, you could think of Y as, for instance, being a label that's telling you that this simulated event is, came from the Higgs boson or, or came from some other background process, and then X would be the data associated to that event. Um, or uh, it could be X is the data associated to uh, a bunch of uh, energy deposits in a, in a detector, and Y is uh, the the you know, true particles energy or something like that that you're trying to, to estimate. So, um, <clears throat> okay, so, 
So there was a little bit of notation and now and now also when you you know the because there were some questions about the empirical risk estimate and when it when that uh, the the function that you get is going to uh, uh, from the empirical approach is going to match the sort of f star that he had, uh, which was like the one you would really like to know, and and uh, and so if you think of it as a Monte Carlo uh, approximation of the integral, it's kind of more obvious that in the limit of lots of data, it should should work out. Um, the other thing that's uh, that I think is important about this is that if I'm trying to, if you know, uh, so Gilles had you know f, um, so he would write something like a, yeah, is this a f star. Uh, is equal to the uh, arg min of uh, f and some function class f of uh, the risk of you know f right. Um, so the so again, this arg min notation is not very common for physicists. I think it hopefully uh, from his lectures it was kind of clear enough what that meant. But basically, you know, you're just you, if you wrote min f, you would be returning. The, the value of the risk that minimizes an argument just means the value of the the argument to that that minimizes it um, and and so then in the examples that he gave the the function class was were things like the linear discriminant analysis or the logistic uh, uh, the uh, uh, logistic regression type of examples and later we're going to hear about neural networks and all sorts of things um, and so again that's kind of like uh, when you have a particular model class like neural networks or logistic regression or a simple linear something, um, you know, I think uh, this is where as physicists we're like, well, that's probably not the right model class, you know, for my problem. My problem is going to look like something else. There's a way that you can think of, which is where you think of this is basically all possible functions. Okay, the model class is just any possible function, and I want to find the, the function that minimizes it over everything. And... Uh, and so in, uh, for physicists, we're kind of used to solving those problems. Uh, for instance, if you have, a, <clears throat> you have a, a rope that you want to tie between two different spots, the rope is going to hang in some sort of a curve, right? And you, there you're trying to find the shape of this curve, that meant, right? And so, and, uh, and so we have like the principle of least action, and uh, there's constraints, and we learn uh, a set of tools around calculus of variations for being able to find the function that minimizes this functional, right? So, um, so to me, I found it very, very useful to use all of, uh, you know, that kind of uh, training that we have as physicists around calculus of variations and functions to do, uh, to analyze these problems. And then basically, if you can end up showing that the in the kind of, in this, uh, you know, I, I have functions of, you know, that can do anything that I want, basically, in the class of functions, F star is the one that I, if, if I can design a risk function such that F star does what I want, uh, then that's kind of, you know, that's, uh, that's good. And, and then you want to give it the most powerful set of functions that you can, and that's basically what neural networks are doing. So they're, they're very, very powerful uh, flexible function class, which is close to the, you know, all possible functions. Um, and that you can then, you know, uh, optimize using this uh, gradient descent algorithm that, uh, instead of calculus of variations. So, um, let's see. So, okay. So that was, um, so that was one thing, uh, that I, I, I wanted to say the, oh yeah. In terms of terminology, um, uh, Jill used this ter term, uh, capacity. So capacity just basically refers to kind of how flexible uh, a function is. There are a few different ways that you can try to formalize it, of, you know, very specific notions of capacity that have formal definitions associated to them. But gener generally, it just means how flexible is your function. And so people sometimes refer to the infinite capacity limit, which means your function can model any possible function, which just means that it's like in the space of all, you know, you could try to make it very mathematical about like, you know, continuous functions or something like that, but, or Lipschitz functions or something. But, um, but generally when, when you do the same kinds of assumptions that you would use when you use calculus of variations is what you mean when you say this infinite capacity limit. Okay. Um, <clears throat> so I have wanted to say a little bit more about that uh, in just a second, but uh, I also realized that before we can say some more about these things, we didn't really talk about uh, joint uh, distributions or conditional distributions and Bayes theorem, even though uh, Jill uh, was using it. So 
I'm guessing that most people have probably heard Bayes' theorem. Uh, some people are very familiar and some people maybe not. Um, but let me just uh, say it quickly. Um, I'm not going to prove it like pictorially because it's, it's easy this way. Um, so let's imagine that um, uh, some, some space of possibilities, OK? Um, and so and for this example, it's going to be this, this uh, square. <laughs> and imagine you're throwing darts at the square, OK? And then um, if here's uh, one shape of target, which I'm going to call uh, A. And here's another shape of target uh, that I'm going to call B. OK, so the kinds of events are, uh, you know, I hit the board anywhere. That's kind of like all possibilities. Uh, I hit A, I hit B, I don't hit A, I don't hit B, I hit A and B, I hit, you know, uh, those are, you know, all these kinds of possibilities, right? And so um, now, um, so pictorially, we can write things like uh, probability of A as the area of, you know, of the that triangle over the whole box, right? And we can write the probability of B as the other triangle um, over the whole box. Um, then we can write something like, uh, I'll put it here in the middle, the probability of uh, A and uh, B. So what's the, pictorially, what's the probability that I hit A and B? Yeah, it's like the little diamond, right? <laughs> the little diamond intersection over the whole box, right? Yeah. Okay, now this one's a little bit trickier. What's the probability that I, I hit A given that I hit B? So given that I hit B means that I know that I'm in somewhere inside of B, right? What's that? Yeah, so, so it's the diamond over uh, the probability for B, right? Yes, okay. And then, and then uh, you know, symmetrically, probability of B given A is the diamond uh, over uh, the other triangle. Yeah, okay, All right. Okay, great. So this is like simple things. And now uh, um, I can do one thing that's kind of nice is that I can, uh, if I multiply, uh, P of A given B times P of B, what do I get? I have, uh, reading it here, I have the diamond over uh, the, the B triangle times P of B, right? Uh, oops, sorry. Which is the, uh, the B triangle over the whole box. These cancel. <laughs> and I have the diamond over the box, which is P of A and B, right? <clears throat> and then you can do the same thing the other way around, which is uh, P of B given A times P of A. Yeah? Okay, so it's just like a simple Bayes theorem, you know, uh, the other version is just that, you know, you have A given B and whatever's on the right side is the one that you follow up, you know, uh, with. Um, but this is this way of kind of chaining together conditional probabilities. And um, and in the, in the conditional, so here I'm writing it out as kind of uh, discrete looking things, right? They're, they're, you're either in A or you're in B. Uh, but in the continuous way, it basically looks exactly the same. So if you have continuous quantities, you can write the probably a P of uh, X comma Y looks like the probability of X given Y uh, times the probability of PY, which I'll, and then the other way around, P of Y given X times the probability of X. Okay, so this is just a, um, whenever you have a joint probability, you can write it as the conditional and then this e extra one, which is referred to as the, the marginal probability. Okay, so if I ask what's the probability of Y, you can think of, um, this is also something that is worth writing, um, is that if I, if I want to ask about the probability of y, I can think of it as integral of uh, p of x and y times uh, dx. So you're, uh, so if I have 
So you can imagine like a two-dimensional distribution. It could be like a two-dimensional histogram or something like that. And if I don't care, if I want to know what the what the distribution looks like for one direction, I just integrate out everything. And uh, people often use the you know this idea of like projecting it the data. Uh, but uh, there are two different types of projections that people do. Uh, essentially, sometimes you slice through the data, and other times you integrate. Um, and this type of integral is called, uh, in, when you're doing Bayesian statistics, is called marginalization. Uh, okay, so when you when you integrate out one of the one of the variables, that's a uh, you're, you marginalize uh, uh, that that variable that you're integrating. Okay, is that fine? Okay, so um, okay, so that's going to be useful for some other things in a second. Um, um, this is the continuous case, um, <clears throat> and so uh, and uh, yeah, usually then when people write Bayes theorem, um, well, I'm running out of room, but okay, I'll go ahead. And, um, well, no, I, <clears throat> yeah, well. Um, I'll make a, a special case of this now. Um, <clears throat> if your loss function uh, equals uh, is you know y comma f of x uh, equals y minus f of x squared, so y is the target that you want, <clears throat> x is your input, f is whatever your you know your predictive model is. And you're just saying the difference between what it predicted and the, the target value squared. That's the, my notion of loss. <clears throat> if you take that and you stick it into this equation, and you do calculus of variations, um, so uh, you know uh, calculus of uh, variations. So you, you, in particular, you do you know the uh, the the um, you know, del R uh, of uh, F over, you know, del F equals zero, and you figure, you know, and you do Euler-Lagrange equations and all these kinds of things, <clears throat> uh, then this implies uh, that the uh, F star um, equals, so this is, this is uh, gonna be a statement that's true uh, for any probability distributions, okay? So for any joint probability distributions for X and Y, um, and you're thinking about the class of all possible functions, okay? So you're not like a neural network or something like that. You're just trying what function is going to minimize the squared loss. Um, it turns out um, that it is, uh, uh, that it's the conditional expectation of Y um, uh, given X. So, so if, so let me, sorry, let me th explicitly write it. So this is a function that's going to take in x as an argument, and it's equal to uh, the conditional expectation of uh, y given uh, p of y, you know, given x um, of <laughs> y. Okay, so, um, so you're basically saying if you could imagine the joint distribution y and x, and you go to that particular value of x, and you, you take a slice through it, so it's a conditional distribution, then you have some new distribution for y, you take the, the, the average of that thing, the average value of y, so that, uh, then that will be the f star. Kind of semi-obvious uh, semi in a way that like, for the value of x that you're at, um, you want, if you, um, if it could predict the mean value of y, then that's going to be kind of closest to the y that you can get, you know, uh, the the target value of y. Um, so um, anyway, so the uh, yeah, so this this way of writing it, um, it, one of the things that's nice about it is that if you change this to like uh, cubed or to the 2.5 power or something like that, um, this is not going to be true. You're going to have the the function f star that optimizes is, or extremizes that is going to be some other function, right? And that's fine. Maybe that's the function you want. Uh, but turning it around the other way is if you know that the function that you want is this, then that's the loss function you want to use. Does that make sense? So I think a lot of times in the story, people think that the loss function is given to you, and then you just do some procedure. And I think that it's much better to think of it the opposite. You're going to say what you want, 
you know, whatever your goals are. And then if you can then, you know, try to figure out what function would do that for you and then try to engineer a loss function that's going to, uh, that's going to be extremized by that function. So, um, so I will give an example in a little bit. Um, we say what it is that we want, we figure out what the function is, um, and then we try to find a loss function that when you extremize it, gives you that function, okay? Um, and that that's a, like a more sort of satisfying, uh, you know, uh, uh, you know, way of seeing it, but it's all the same information. Um, okay, <clears throat> great, so is that, is that fine so far? Yeah, okay, um, now, uh, um, so I wanted to then I wanted to get uh, uh, to a couple a couple of examples using this kind of formulation that then uh, ties back into the stuff that, that I was talking about earlier. Okay, so um, um, so let, let me think. Um, okay, so maybe the the first thing that uh, um, sorry. Let me think about what I want to say. Um, okay, yeah, so I'll do this one real quick. So this y, you know, this p of y given x, let's just write it down really quickly. Uh, so p of y given x, um, if you use Bayes' theorem, uh, what, what does it, you know, what does it look like? Uh, you know, it looks like p of x given y times p of, of y over um, uh, P of X, and then and then as uh, Gilles wrote it down, that you can uh, you can think of that as the well as the the as the the marginal. Okay, so this P of X is going to you can uh, you can do the same kind of thing, but integrating the other one. Um, but let's think about the binary case. Okay, so let's think about uh, uh, binary. Uh, classification, um, where uh, y either equals zero or y you know equals one, right? So in this case, we can go back to the, you know, uh, th this is also something that Gilles is doing in his notation. He would write like a capital Y equals little y. In this way of writing it, usually the capital letter is referring to the random variable, like thinking of it as a random variable without specifying its value. And the lowercase one is like, it takes on this particular value, okay? So another way of writing would, would be sort of like, you know, y equals one or something like that. Um, so you could, you could write that. Um, so I don't know if you prefer, but so I can put y equals one here, p of y equals one. And then this p of x, I can break out into uh, p of x, um, uh, sorry, yeah, given y equals one times, <laughs> this gets to be kind of tedious to write down, but okay, uh, times the other way around, p of uh, x given y equals zero plus, uh, sorry, uh, times p of y equals zero. Okay, is that, is that fine? Okay, um, so this is this. Uh, uh, Jules wrote down, so I was trying to like connect back to what he was saying. So, um, what you're saying here is, you know, the, given my data event, I want to know do I it as a cat? Given my and uh, so if I think of you know y equals one as like Higgs boson or signal, um, then you know then uh, this is this is what it's trying to compute, but. The, the important thing about you know Bayes is that you know in order to calculate it, you have these other you have these other quantities there. So um, so uh, okay. So I'm going to before I sort of ruin my my uh, I'm going to come back to this. This is just a formula. This is Gilles already wrote it down. Okay, but I'm, I um, and he showed in, in various ways that you can get to this, um, and so. Uh, when he was doing it, he, he talked about a loss function for classification that he wrote as uh, one of uh, y not equals f of x or something. This was the, the loss function y comma f of x uh, for uh, binary uh, classification, right? 
right? So this is so this the idea here. This is called the zero one loss. It's basically you, you, the output of f is just going to be a zero or a one. It's not going to be a it's not going to be a continuous number, right? So you're you're going to give it a data event x, and f is going to output either a zero or one, and then this is basically counting how many mistakes you make, right? And this one, basically, remember, it's a, it, gives, it gives you one if you make a mistake. It gives you zero if you don't make a mistake, right? So there's another way of doing binary classification where your f doesn't give you, um, doesn't give you uh, uh, just zero or one, but it outputs a continuous number. And so in particular, if you have f of x output a, a continuous number between zero and one, and, uh, and this is the loss function that you use, then when you train your neural network or whatever it is, uh, I just told you that as, as long as you're out of, of capacity, right, then, the, then if this is the loss function that you're using, the, the thing that it will end up con this conditional probability. And, the, uh, and then the, uh, um, and then the, uh, and, and when you, and when you want to do, deal with that, with that, uh, that uh, that uh, probability, you're just it's going to just be this function, okay? So, um, okay. So there's another way to. Get, I guess my point is that you can also do binary classification where instead of having an output uh, zero one, it can output a continuous number, and it's basically the same kind of idea, but you're going to get out this uh, this conditional probability, okay? Which follows very nicely from Bayes' theorem. Now, um, um, it, it, okay. Now the um, okay, so <clears throat> now I'm going to kind of pause and switch into a, a particle physics gear for just a second um, and talk about uh, the Higgs discovery. Okay, so when we, uh, this sounds like a very different thing, but when we, when we uh, go to search for a new particle, like when we were searching for the Higgs, um, we're basically setting it up as a, as a hypothesis test, right? We have, we have two hypotheses. Uh, a null hypothesis, which is like, say, the standard model background with no Higgs boson, and an alternate hypothesis, which is the background plus the Higgs boson. And we're trying to choose between them based on the data, right? Is that so very simple kind of middle school, you know, science class hypothesis testing. Um, uh, so what I want you to think about is what is the form of the statement uh, that, that led to the discovery, right? We have two, these two hypotheses around. We collected some data at the LHC, and then we claimed a discovery. But you know, uh, in, this, in the paper, there's some kind of you know, precise sentence that involves the words probability, you know, uh, the Higgs boson exists or does not exist, you know, LHC data. And it's either going to involve a very big, like a number very close to one, like 99.9%, .9 or a number that's very small, like, you know, 0.1% or something like that. So, um, so does anyone want to uh, throw out a, a sentence that, that kind of has the right structure to it? Do you understand what I'm getting at? You, I don't know if you know the Mad Libs, where you have like a sentence, and there's fill in the blanks, and you have to choose for some things. So I can do the Mad Lib version if you want, you know. Um, but it's, uh, you know, I'm looking for so something that's like, you know, uh, the probability uh, of fill in the blank, you know, <laughs> uh, is fill in the blank, you know, large, small, you know, uh, so like 99% or, uh, you know, slash 1%. Something like that. You know, I mean, they're, they're, the numbers are probably more extreme than that, but um, uh, get, fill in the blank. Okay, and the fill in the blanks are going to involve, you know, data and Higgs boson or standard model or something like that. Okay, so the probability of the null hypothesis. So this would be like background background only is small given the data. Yeah, and because that, if that's sufficiently small, then we say we're not happy with it, and so we, we reject that hypothesis. Okay, sound good? Okay. 
is is weak. Big, yeah. So the other version would could be, you know, the of Higgs, you know, is big, you know, <laughs> you know, large, yeah, large. Uh, still given the data, right? But then there's a question of, you know, you could turn, uh, you know, the Higgs exists or doesn't. The question of how equivalent are these? If you're really setting it up as you have two options, you know, then these are basically the sa same statement. The probability that the Higgs does not, ex you know, the probability that the the back true is just like one minus the probability that the Higgs is true, right? But you could get into some kind of more philosophical question about are those the, all the possibilities and things like that. But that's not really the the direction that I'm wanting to go down. But it is worth thinking about, and people do worry about. Uh, if you want to say this one is small or this one is big, okay? Um, but that's not the thing that I want to focus on right now. Okay, fine. But but everyone okay with one, you know with one of these two options if we treat them as roughly equivalent for now? Yes. Okay. So let's revisit uh, Bayes' theorem now. So we have like A's and B's, right? Um, um, Okay, so uh, doo -doo -doo -doo. let's go back over here. So it, the, the outcome of Bayes' theorem that we had there was the probability of, of A given B uh, is equal to the probability of B given A times the probability of A over the probability of B. Okay, this, was, this is kind of Bayes' theorem in the way that it's written a lot of times is referred to as an inverse uh, you know, statement about probabilities because you knew this one and you wanted to get to this one. Okay, so our statement here, uh, if we were to just generally label them, uh, one side is theory and one side is data. This is the theory sec section, right? Uh, and this is the data section, right? So what we're, the statements that we're making, whether or not they're big or small, refer to probability of theory given data, and that's equal to probability of data given theory times probability of theory over probability of data. Yes? Okay. So now let's think about which of these things uh, do we know how to, uh, to calculate, okay, as, the, you know, as theorists. Uh, you've, you've taken your quantum field theory classes, um, and we talked earlier about this like forward model, right? What does the forward model predict for you? What, what, what like when we, <clears throat> you know, you have Feynman diagrams. Uh, uh, Right, like earlier we were, you know, I, I spent the whole first lecture doing things like Poisson of n given mu, right? And mu was something like luminosity times cross-section times efficiency times acceptance plus, you know, or just leave it at that for now, right? So from the theory side, I'm able to predict cross-sections and things like this, right? And then that predicts an expected number of events, and then I can make some arguments about quantum mechanics about how many collisions I expect to see. Right? Where is the data on this side? The random variable, the data is here, right? This is the data. And this part is what I'm calculating from the theory, all right? So the thing that we started with, you know, um, the thing that I know how to calculate as a, as a theorist is you, give, you tell me the parameters of the standard model or some alternate theory, I can calculate scattering cross sections and differential cross sections and things like that and based on that I can predict what the you know what the distribution of the data should look like but the data is going to be random right uh, <clears throat> so this is this piece right here which is which in Bayes theorem is usually referred to as the likelihood this is the part that I know how to calculate from from theory what about this probability of theory my theory examples here are the Higgs exists or does not exist. What's the, what's the, this is what's referred to as the prior. What's the prior probability that the Higgs exists before we make the LHC? 
and when we made the statement in our discovery paper, uh, you can imagine the arguments that we had inside of Atlas and CMS where we all had to agree on what the prior probability that the Higgs existed before we built LHC was, right? So is that something you can calculate? Yeah, so I mean, in a, like a, in a multiverse type of picture, there might be lots of hunks of the universe with different values and things, like that, and you can add a distribution of Higgs exists or doesn't exist or things like that, but uh, and the kind of more standard one, you know, the Higgs, you know, like the parameters of the standard model take on a particular value. They don't, they're not like, they don't have a distribution. They're like some unknown parameter, right? And so in that sense, uh, you know, the, the, this theory side, that's why I was kind of using the theta parameter, right? It's like, it takes on some value that I don't know. Um, and then this one probability of data is kind of weird. You know, this is like, what's the probability of getting the LHC data that's a, a strange one. That one is easier to think about if you think about uh, integrating uh, P of uh, data uh, given theory times your prior probability for the theory over all possible theories. You know, that, that's P data. Um, so if you, if you, this thing you can predict. So if you did have a prior probability for the theories, then you have a joint probability for the theory and the data, and you can just integrate and get P data. And you can think of this as just a normalization constant. It's a, it's a number that you had to get so that when you integrate this over the theory that it integrates up to one. Okay, so this you can just think of as kind of a normalization if you want. So, okay, so given that, um, you can, so I don't know. Uh, this seems very like what you would want to say, right? you would like to be able to collect some data at the LHC and then end up being able to say that the probability for the Higgs is large given the data and that's why we claim a discovery, right? But uh, this, is not, this is not the way it's stated in, the, in the, you know, the discovery papers because we couldn't, you know, particle physicists are, you know, uh, really not happy with this kind of quantity, okay? Yeah. Um, yeah, so you can think, I mean, if you want, then you just kind of expand the space of theory to include more and more possible, you know, theories, and this integral over theory is just including all of them. Um, if you ever want to be able to say a statement of the form probably of theory given data, um, then you're going to have to invoke a prior. Um, if you don't do that and you want to restrict yourself to statements of the form probability of data given theory, then you can say there's many such theories where this probability of the data given the theory is sufficiently large that you consider it acceptable, and these are all the theories that are consistent with the data. Um, okay, so, uh, right. So I just wanted to kind of make this point. That this, is, this is this kind of logical uh, sort of mistake that humans are really, uh, it's, t it's two things. One is it's a mistake to think that these two things are the same. That's just a mistake. Then there's we would like to be able to make a statement like this, Everyone, I think, agrees you would like to make the statement, but the only way you'll ever be able to make the statement is if you have a prior over the theories, and if you're not comfortable with that, then you, don't, uh, you can't do that. And you're gonna have to make a statement instead of the, of the, you know, the other form that involves probably a data given, given theory. Is that, is that fine? Okay. Um, now, part of the reason that I, I, I bring this is if you turn it into, if you try to think about a classification problem like this, and you thought of it as, uh, you know, y equals zero and one instead of being cat and dog images as being something like uh, Higgs bosons or not Higgs bosons, you know, like similar background examples, then you, you need this prior probability here to, to compute this thing. And, uh, you know, usually when we, for instance, train our neural networks, we just generate a bunch of signal events and a, train a bunch of background events and we train a classifier and like the, the um, and that, pri the, and if you train a classifier, these, these quantities uh, refer to in your training data, what fraction of them are signal events versus which fraction of them are background events. And this is what it will compute. This is what the neural network will learn. But uh, that might not be, that, that might not have anything to do with like the, you know, you don't know what the prior probabilities are in, in actual, you know, in reality, right? Um, okay, so I'll come back to that in a second. But, uh, but these things in the neural network way 
Um, and this is, I guess I should say it. This is, um, you know, I, I kind of have a bit of a reputation for being, you know, like, uh, on the frequentist side, there's the Bayesian and the frequentist approaches, and the Bayesian one is going to say probability of theory, and the frequentist one is going to be restricted to probability of data given theory. Um, and um, it's not that I, I mean, I can speak both languages. I'm totally happy with both. It's just that I know what it is about ph the physicists don't like about this prior on the theories. Um, but when I do machine learning, I feel much more comfortable being a Bayesian because my interpretation of this prior is not uh, my degree of belief in the state of nature. It's just a statement about my training data. You know, like I created this training data set and I basically get to choose the priors. Uh, and, and, and then I also, it's something I should worry about that if, uh, if in my training data, the, the, the ratio of signal and background is one thing, and then I go to apply it to data, then I need I may need to correct for that in some way. So it's something that it's like I need to be aware of about the uh, the balance of the different classes in my in my data sets. So, okay. All right. Um, now, do to do. do um, <clears throat> so, so I have a little bit. But when I started at two thirty, and I should go until. It's an hour 45, is that right? Yeah. Okay, so that helped me do the math. So I've been awake for a long time, uh, so and not uh, slept a whole lot. So 2.30 goes to, uh, yeah, four, okay, 4.15, yeah. All right, so, um, uh, okay. <clears throat> so how would you approach this hypothesis testing problem if you wanted to do it without uh, prior probabilities? Okay, so, um, the typical setup here is you think about uh, two hypotheses, you know, so you ha a lot of times you have like hypothesis zero, which is, you know, something like, you know, y equals zero, and, uh, and hypothesis, one, you know, hypothesis one, uh, which we can think of as like y equals one, and these are like your null and your alternate hypotheses. And then you set up this kind of, uh, you know, uh, sort of silly table uh, where you're going to, uh, this is supposed to be the state of nature. This is like a, this is the, the state of nature. Um, and then you're going to make a decision, okay? Uh, um, and where you're going to either, for instance, uh, um, sorry, uh, accept uh, the null hypothesis or reject uh, the null hypothesis. So this is just what you're doing. It doesn't mean that you're right, right? So if you accept the null hypothesis when the null hypothesis is true, good job, right? Okay. If you ex if you reject the null hypothesis when the alternate hypothesis is true, good job. Okay. Um, but you can make two kinds of mistakes, right? If the null hypothesis is true and you reject the null hypothesis, that's one kind of mistake. And <clears throat> it's totally a convention, but people refer to this as a type one error. Okay. And if, uh, uh, you know, if the null hypothesis is true, uh, I'm sorry, sorry, if the alternate hypothesis is true and you accept it, then that you also make a mistake and this is called type two error, okay. And so you can think of these in terms of like, uh, you know, when you take a, uh, uh, a, a blood test to see if you have a disease or something like that, you can think of like you either have the disease or you don't have the disease and uh, you get the report back, you know, that it's right or not. And so people use the terms like false positives and false negatives and things like that. I find that that language to be confusing because which one's positive and which one is negative. You know, I, I tend to get confused, but it's, it's type one and type two is also kind of uh, gets confusing. But the way that it typically is, is that you think of the null hypothesis, um, you, you, you treat the situation kind of asymmetrically and you treat the null hypothesis as special. And you say what you want to, this is not the only way to do it, but it's the kind of classical way to do it. it you say that you want to try to come up with a, a decision-making procedure where given the data, I'm going to either accept or reject the null, and, the th and I'm going to try to adjust the properties of this procedure so that I make a type one error with some controlled probability. 
Okay, so this probability is uh, the you know the probability of this is usually referred to as alpha, and the probability of this kind of error is referred to as beta. Okay, um, and uh, and and I'll actually write it this way: the, if the if you if the data sits in this region where you're going to reject the null, so I'll call that W, uh, given uh, H naught, that equals alpha. And the and if the probability region W given H1 is called beta, okay? So if, the, if X falls in W, I'm gonna reject the null. So that's what I mean by this row. And if, you, and if X doesn't fall in, in W, um, then I'm going to accept the null, okay? Is that fine? Okay, so in this setup, um, the, the, and this is, this is what, uh, the, the, the statisticians, this is what uh, uh, Nyman and uh, Pearson um, uh, hypothesis testing. This is how they thought of the problem, was uh, to treat uh, that you're going to control this one. You're going to try to con uh, find a region W such that uh, this, the probability of incorrectly rejecting the null is, is, is controlled to be alpha. Sorry, my... Sorry about my writing there. Okay, is that, is that fine? Now this probability, do I need a prior to be able to calculate that probability? Now I'm gonna, I'm gonna assume some hypothesis and then I'm gonna be predicting you know, the, some, some probability that has to do with the data. So this is a probability of data given theory statement. So this is, a, I can do that, that and I can also calculate the other one. So, so the idea is you're going to do two things. One is uh, fix uh, uh, alpha uh, to be some value, and then the or bigger than some crit you know cutoff. And then the second thing that you want to do is there might be lots of different ways uh, to control this probability. So, for instance, we could build the LHC if we wanted alpha to be five percent. We could build the LHC, collect the LHC data, and then flip a bunch of coins. And if they turn out a certain way, we could claim discovery of the Higgs, right? That would like have the right probability, but it would have nothing to do with the data and would not be like a smart way to do it. So there's lots of ways of controlling this probability. The thing that you want to do next is, is what about beta? Do you want it to be big or small? You want it to be small. You don't want, and so this probability over here is one minus beta, right? This is just the complementary probability. Um, sorry, I did it the wrong way. Um, sorry, uh -huh. one minus beta. So um, if the if the alternate is true, um, the 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 chance that you reject the null hypothesis, the background only, and claim a discovery of the Higgs particle, you want that to be as big as possible, right? So um, and so you want to fix alpha and then uh, try to minimize beta uh, slash maximize one minus beta. And one minus beta has a name. This is called the power, the power of the test. And this value, uh, alpha, is called the size of the test. Okay, whatever, size is not a very useful name, but that's what people call it, yeah. Yeah, so when people talk about like 95% and 99%, uh, the, that's what they're controlling is the, well, the invert, you know, the complement. So, like a 95% confidence level or something like that, what you're doing is you're setting alpha to 5%. Okay. Um, and, and like uh, tests, what, so, when, uh, so the typical, you know, like uh, uh, blood tests and things like that, um, they, they control th this rate to be some number. Um, and then, uh, okay. Now, <clears throat> So then you can try to think about like what is the best way to do this. So in a simple, so a simple example, which would be a one-dimensional problem, you would have, say, two different distributions. This would be uh, x, and you can think of this as p of x given, you know, alternate hypothesis. This is p of x given h naught, right? So what is the what is the best test? that you can make. You have my, I have distributions of the data for two hypotheses. 
what do I want to do? I, want, I need to find a region W where if the data falls in there, I'm going to reject the null. Okay? So there's an infinite number of different regions of X that will have the right probability. Like I could choose this, you know, this little region right here and make that probability be alpha, right? And that would satisfy uh, the size constraint. Uh, but what's the power? The power would be, you know, the, the area under here, which would be incredibly tiny, right? So this, 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 uh, this approach has very little power. So this would be, this, you know, this little region could be W. Um, and uh, so that's not going to be a good way to do it. Um, but looking at it, like, w when, would you, when would you say that you have evidence for the alternate hypothesis? If you're, like, over here, right? So you just have a threshold that you're going to scan, right? Until, until what? Until somewhere over here that this probability equals alpha, right? Does that make sense? And everything to the right, so then this region and over is going to be W. That's, the, that's this uh, critical region. If the data falls in here, you reject the null. And then the, the power is this huge probability now, right? Um, and, uh, and so this has a lot of power, this test. And so in this simple 1D example, it's really obvious what the most powerful test is, right? This, was, this, this picture is the most powerful test you can come up with. Is that, is that okay? But in, in multidimensional problems, it's a lot harder. So like imagine that you have even just 2D, um, and you have, um, I'll say that the, you know, the zeros are going to be the marker for P of X zero, and, and Xs are going to be the, or plus signs, are going to be the markers for H1. So imagine I have like zeros kind of sort of scattered all around here, you know, everywhere. And then I have uh, a bunch of pluses, you know, in this region. Right, and maybe there's a little bit of a, a, you know, a little bit of a something out here. So what's the most powerful region now? So now it's harder. I mean, you, can, you would imagine that it's going to be something that's kind of like roughly of this shape, right? Some kind of contour like that that gets as much of the H1s as possible and, you know, as few of the H0s as possible. And then you need to figure out what contour, you know, like how tight the contour needs to be to be able to satisfy this, uh, the equivalent of this alpha requirement, right? That the, does that make sense? Uh, I mean, pictorially. So, so this is a harder problem. And, and uh, so you can imagine that you know these distributions and you can try to figure out what is, is there an optimal solution to this problem? And, uh, <clears throat> and there, there is, and it turns out that it's actually like pretty easy. Um, um, well, actually, I want to keep that one. Uh, yeah, okay. Okay, um, and so this is, this is called the, uh, the Nyman uh, Pearson uh, lemma. Um, and it says that, uh, uh, basically the statement is that the uh, most powerful um, simple uh, um, hypothesis uh, test uh, is uh, given by a gone tour of uh, the uh, likelihood uh, ratio. Okay, um, so in particular, uh, W is is uh, is the set of x's such that uh, p of x given h1 over p of x given uh, h0 is bigger than some contour level and you have to adjust the contour level to get the desired size. So you just scan, so there's a contour. So imagine here that there's a, a function coming out of the board. You just adjust the, the contour level until the probability under the null is what you want it to be. Okay, now look at this for a little bit. X is, 
is, can be high dimensional data. In my simple example, it's two dimensional data. But this is a probability is a scalar, right? It's just a number. And so this is a number over a number. So this is a function that goes to the real line, right? And then you're just, you're just contour, finding a contour level for it. Okay. And the quick proof of this, just because it's so, so fun to do, um, is that uh, let's imagine uh, W. This is W. Um, and so these are all the points where that likelihood ratio, P of X given uh, H1 over P of X given H0 is bigger than K. I'll drop the alpha subscript for now. Okay, so this is, this is uh, 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 the, you know, the, the assumption. So we'll do it as like a proof by contradiction. Okay, so you can, you can uh, consider, uh, do I have color? Um, there was color before, wasn't there? Or just this? I don't know if this is gonna work. Um, okay, I'll, I'll, I'll do this. We can consider some, some uh, um, deformation of that contour, okay? Oh, thanks. Ah, I'll give it, okay. Okay, um, I'll try to do red and blue. Let's see if this works. Okay, so, so this will be like some red area, and this will be some blue area. Yeah? Okay, so when I make this, uh, when I make this uh, deformation, it's some new contour, okay? So this is my new W prime, right? So if the data falls here, it's just like it, it you know, fell in W, okay? So I will be uh, accepting, I'll, I'll be rejecting the null. If the data falls here, it's outside of W, the new W, and I will be uh, accepting the null. Is that? So this, in here, if it's inside the, contour, this is W, and this is, these are the situations, if X falls in W, I'm rejecting the null, okay. Now, I still, in the setup, I still need to satisfy this other deformed contour still needs to satisfy this constraint. So whatever probability I add under the null needs to be equal to the probability that I subtracted under the null. Does that, does that make sense? So I know that I need P of, of, uh, something given uh, H naught equal to P of something given uh, H naught where the, the, there are the two regions, you know, so there, there's this region and then there's the blue region, right? So whatever I add uh, needs to be what I subtract under the null hypothesis in order to keep it, uh, uh, in order for it to have the same size. Is that okay? But then, but now I can ask about the, the same thing in the, in the other direction, is uh, what about P of that thing under uh, H1, you know, of this red piece under H1? What do I know about it? Well, I know that it's on the outside of this contour, so this likelihood ratio has to be less than K, right? So this thing has to be less than K, uh, sorry, this over, um, well, you could, you could do it uh, a couple different ways. I can write this, the probability of the same piece. Okay, well, do it. Probability of the same piece under uh, H naught has to be less than K, right? Here's the red piece, right? And, and then simultaneously, so now I can just take this thing and move it over if I want, right? So I'm gonna probability of red piece given H naught, right? I'm just moving it to the other side of the equation, right? And, comp and then, and so I have that, and then I also have the other way around uh, for the blue piece, but now the inequality is reversed. Do you see what I mean? So uh, I could write the same equation uh, for, but use the blue piece, and, and then now it's going to be uh, greater than. Right? So uh, H naught, K, P, this is the whole same. Uh, uh, equation, but now for the blue piece. Because this blue piece is inside the contour, so I know for all these parts, this prob this uh, this ratio is bigger than H0. Um, and so then if you want, you just take this and flip around the, the direction, right? So I know that this is less than P of the blue piece given um, 
H1. Okay, blue piece. Yeah? So what do I have? I know that the probability of the red piece under the alternate hypothesis is less than the probability of the blue piece under the alternate hypothesis. So I just proved that. And so now that, how do I relate that to the statement of, about the power, right? What I want, this, this region is supposed to be the part where I'm accepting the alternate hypothesis, and I want that to be as big as possible when the alternate hypothesis is true. But the piece that I added, the probability of that under the alternate hypothesis is less than the probability of the piece that I removed under the alternate hypothesis. So this new test has less power. Yeah? So less powerful, you know. Uh, yeah. Is that, is that fine? So this is the proof of the Nyman-Pearson lemma. And what it tell, and so this is the reason why likelihood ratios are so, uh, so important. Okay, you see them all the time. Um, and, and again, this is done in a totally like frequentist way. So you're coming up with a test of the null hypothesis that's as, power as powerful as possible you know, for this alternative, um, and uh, you don't need any prior probabilities to do that. Okay, is that, is that all good? Okay, so now, um, so now given this, I wanna go back to the Bayes approach and, and just note something, um, is that uh, it's easier to see if I just, uh, if I consider an example, uh, let's get, I'm not gonna use this. Uh, uh, for example, if, if I set um, P of, y equal to zero equal to p of y uh, equal uh, to one equal to a half, if they're both a half, uh, then all those things will cancel, okay? And then you get to p of uh, x given, uh, you know, I'll just write one over p of uh, x given uh, one plus p of x given zero, right? <clears throat> And then if, uh, and then uh, I can divide by this thing on the on the top and make it be one over uh, one plus, you know, p of x given zero over p of x given one, um, and you can do some more arithmetic. But the the main point is that it it picks out the the likelihood ratio, right? And it turns out that for any prior, uh, it's going to be the same thing, but just with some some coefficients floating around. And so the important part is that this quantity right here um, th is that P of uh, Y given X uh, is, is you know, monotonic or is, is a, a one to one uh, with uh, P of, of uh, uh, X given, uh, you know, Y equals one over P of X given Y equals zero. Uh, uh, for all, you know, priors. Okay, so, so that basically means that if you think about the contours of this function, they're going to be the same as the contours of that function, just with just different levels of where that you draw the contour level, right? So if I go back to this problem and I, and I think about if I train a, a neural network with, say, equal size of signal and background training samples, um, then it's going to learn this function, and then I can threshold on that neural network's output, and I adjust the, the threshold of that output until I have the right size test, and the, the, uh, the, uh, the contour that's gonna pick out is gonna be exactly the same as if I had done the Nyman Pearson and, uh, and, uh, and, and drawn the, thre the, put a threshold on that. Is that, is that okay? Yeah, so, so this thing, an, another way of looking at it is that uh, uh, in the end, the, these things are both just some, there's some functions that I stick in data, right? And so I can think about, uh, generically, I can think of these things as a, a, as a you know, function, I'll, well, maybe I'll call it uh, S of X, okay? And there's, you know, there's, there's two different options for what S of X is. Here's, you know, there's this version and there's this version, okay? It's just some function that takes in data and sticks out a scalar, right? 
And so I can think of uh, this being S, and I can think of what the distribution of S looks like uh, under the two hypotheses. This would be uh, P of S given you know, H0 or Y0 or you know, Y equals 0 or something, and this is P of S given uh, H1. It's now a scalar, right? And so you're just going to go, it's going to be like that first picture. You're just going to find the point where you threshold such that this probability is, uh, is alpha. And so that threshold um, uh, is going to pick out a, a particular contour, and it's going to be the same contour whether you threshold on this thing or this thing if your procedure is, the, you know, you, you, uh, you, you find whatever threshold has that probability underneath it. Yeah, because they're the same set of contours, and you just adjust it until you have the right probability sitting there. And so this is nice because this works even if the data here at x could be super high dimensional, but it's returning, it's taking the high dimensional data and squishing it onto the real line, and you have this story to, to tell, right? Okay, now, um, so this part, I know I've kind of, it's likely that, you know, hopefully the logic is you're following, but it could be kind of blurring, but uh, wake up for this part, because this part's important, is that, you know, I told you earlier that in our, uh, if we have this, you know, our stack of uh, simulations, um, and this is true both for like uh, the particle physics simulation that goes from, you know, uh, uh, Feynman diagrams through the parton shower and the detector simulation is also true of, uh, 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 you know, cosmological simulations where you're putting in lambda CDM parameters and then you're running in-body simulations of the early universe and having radiation come through us and pass through you know, gas and dust and all that kind of stuff, if you have that forward model of what the final data looks like and you kind of believe that forward model, um, those forward models tend to have these intractable likelihood functions, right? So if the, if the likelihood function is intractable, can you calculate this likelihood ratio? Yeah, I don't know. Maybe, yeah. I mean, if, if you certainly can't do it in, a, in the normal way. If the likelihood function is intractable, that means I can't calculate the numerator or the denominator because they, they both have secretly inside of them this integrals over all the possible stuff that would have happened inside of the simulation chain, and that's, like, impossible to integrate. So this theorem, this lemma, is, you know, is a, is a nice, the Snyman-Pearson lemma is a nice lemma, but it's not uh, useful if you have an intractable likelihood function, Right? Uh, however, what did we show? We showed that this is equivalent to uh, this P of Y given X, right? And where did P of Y of, uh, given X come from? It came from, you know, this whole thing, which was the solution which I now erased of doing this, uh, minimizing this risk function, the squared loss, right? So if you start with the squared loss and you minimize it, you'll be approximating this function. And the important part there is there's the true squared loss where you know the actual distribution, empirical approximation of that, which you can generate samples of y equals 0 and y equals 1. You can use them as training data into a neural network. The neural network will approximate this function. This function is one-to-one -one with this thing, which is what I want. So that's the... That's the logical chain, which is why the squared loss is a well-motivated quantity uh, to try to optimize, because it's going to give you a function which is close to the provably optimal thing from the Nyman-Pearson lemma, and it's still practical even when you don't know what the what the function is. So that's like that's why I would think of this as like an approach for doing likelihood-free inference. You have a forward model, you use machine learning, and then you you satisfy like some kind of classical statistical something at least approximately, right? Um, so, yeah, so that, that observation then led uh, to, you know, well, a whole series of papers with more complicated versions of how to uh, realize, like, uh, the statistical program that we do with LHC with using, like, machine learning, and it allows us to use higher dimensional data X instead of just one dimensional data, because I couldn't, you know, the, the other way that we would have done this is estimate these things with histograms, and, like, that doesn't work if X is very high dimensional, so, um, okay. Yes. Right. <laughs> Wait, why, why, can, why, can't you, why can't you do that? Right. 
Yeah, so, so, the, so continue with your question, but there's nothing wrong with me saying I want to have, you know, uh, the, 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 fixing it to be 95% is not your problem. You just say I want it to be 95%. The, the, the problem is that, yeah, you don't calculate this quantity. Yeah. 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 So um, no, that's a good question. So what you can do is, if you if you wanted, is you could figure out with the likelihood ratio uh, what value of alpha. Then that's going to have some threshold associated to it, which I called k sub alpha, and you stick that uh, into you know here, right? And then you work out what is the what that turns into as a threshold on on this quantity. Yeah, I, yeah. I mean, you, you, uh, you, you. I mean, you you can relate to the likelihood ratio to this this uh, conditional probability, even you know, for any value of this ratio. Even if you can't calculate, you just, but you won't know which one corresponds to the ninety five percent. Yeah, you just you won't know the. Yeah. I mean, if you can't calculate the likelihood. Is you can't do any of the like. I mean, you can't do the normal Bayesian thing either. You know, th this one, you could do this approach uh, without any machine learning. You could just, if you can calculate the likelihoods, you would just write this down and calculate it, right? Yeah. Um, the, the issue about the intractability is kind of a somewhat orthogonal thing about how the the frequentists and the Bayesian ones uh, relate to each other. Um, okay. All right. Um, Okay, now the, the thing that uh, I'm not going to go into now, but I'll try to say something about a little bit later, is that there is this kind of nice framework, uh, which is called uh, statistical decision theory, which is kind of an overarching framework for uh, making decisions. And, uh, and what, you, you come to, uh, what you come with is a statistical model for the data given different values of some parameter or theory or you know, hypothesis or whatever you want. You, you optionally come with a, uh, a prior for the, the theories, and then you come up with um, basically uh, a, uh, something like a risk function, like what is it that the loss function says, uh, you, know, uh, you know, how bad was this action? And then you also come with what's called a, a decision rule, which says that given this data, I'm going to make some decision. And then you basically evaluate if that was a good decision or not. And so you, you bring all of these things together, and then you can talk about notions of optimal decisions and things. So this would be, this story would fit into that, that framework, but also many Bayesian things do. And what's nice about that framework is that you can see the connection of the Bayesian approach and the frequentist approach, which things you, know, you, you can do that are going to be optimal, which things you can't do. Uh, if you don't come with a prior. Um, so I'll say a little bit about that later, but I just remember this Nyman Pearson example because it's one example that fits into that statistical decision theory language. Um, and that, that language also uh, kind of lends itself very naturally to things like reinforcement learning and stuff like that. So that, that uh, um, so the decision in that situation would be something like you're playing a game of go against a computer or an opponent, you know, and you need to, given the state of the board, you need to take some action and like, you know, and then based on if you win or lose, you know, the game, essentially, uh, you know, that's going to be, you'll have some notion of your reward or loss or risk. And so you can put these kinds of things into that framework as well. Um, okay. Um, <clears throat> so I, I have until... Uh, I have like 20 minutes, right? Is that right? Am I wrong? Yeah? Okay, so um, then I want to say one more thing and then we'll, I'll be done. Okay, so the, um, so this was basically hypothesis testing um, and, uh, and, you know, Bayes' theorem and connections to, you know, machine learning speak about risk and things like that. Um, um, So you know, of the statistical tasks that that you do as a physicist, you know, making uh, uh, discoveries, you know, doing hypothesis, one of the big things. You're doing searches for new particles. You'd like to be able to claim a discovery or not. Another big thing that you do is you put limits on parameters. You say like, this is a region of parameter space. 
or this is the set of theories that are consistent with the data, and these are the ones that are not, and and you uh, um, and you reject those. Um, I'm not going to do it now, but basically you can bootstrap hypothesis testing. Uh, and I wrote uh, in there uh, simple hypothesis testing. Simple hypothesis testing means I'm I'm comparing a, a null against an alternate, and they're both totally they don't have any other free parameters. They're just two specific uh, hypotheses. If you start having uh, a hypothesis with a free parameter in it, like uh, the standard model with everything fixed versus some super symmetric theory where I don't specify the values of those parameters, that's called a composite hypothesis, not a simple hypothesis. And uh, things are a little bit more complicated, but it's basically the same story. So you can end up, you can bootstrap hypothesis testing into doing something for uh, limits and confidence intervals and things where you try to say which region of a of the parameters of a theory are consistent with the data, but I'll do that later. I'm going to do it now. Um, and then the other, you know, big thing that we do uh, uh, is is uh, to try to estimate parameters, right? So not just say which regions are consistent with the data, but try to say like which one do you think is the you know the best value? Try to estimate the parameters of that of that theory, right? So so that's what I want to talk about really quickly. Uh, uh, Okay, so the starting point here is I can imagine I have some statistical model P of X given theta. Um, and uh, given data, I want to estimate uh, the value of this parameter. Okay, that's my goal. Okay, uh, you know, given uh, X, uh, estimate uh, theta. And, then, and, and the notation is going to be uh, theta hat of x. Okay, so that's this is my general notation for an estimate of theta given the data x. And sometimes it'll just be theta hat without the parentheses x. Okay, so um, now there's lots of ways to do this, um, uh, but there are a few things that you can say in general about estimation which are kind of kind of nice. Okay, without trying to start off with a recipe of how are you going to estimate it, talk about like what are the properties that I want in an estimate. Does that make sense? So the first thing you can think about is the bias of an estimator. Okay, and so the bias of an estimator, what you think of is uh, uh, theta hat. I'm going to stick in there, uh, given theta, and that's going to be defined as, um, if you want, it's like the expected value. Uh, you know, under P of X given theta, you know, of theta hat, which depends on the data X, given that value of theta, okay, so, or I guess that's already, that's already there, um, uh, minus theta, or if you want to really write it out super explicitly, P of X uh, given theta times X DX, um, sorry, uh, theta hat of X, uh, dx uh, minus theta, right? So this is saying, I have some statistical model, I consider a particular value of theta, I use it to to take this expectation, you know, so you can, and, and so I'm integrating over x, assuming the distribution for that value of theta. For each value of x, I stick it into this function, and I take its average, right? And then whatever its average is, I subtract off the true value of and see what the difference is. If the if this is zero, that's that's good, right? It means that your esti your 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 estimate of of, uh, of theta is unbiased, right? So you can think of uh, here's my theta hat direction. I have a distribution of theta hat. Um, th this is the the expected value, and you could have theta over here, and this difference right here is the bias, right? So this would be biased. Um, is that fine? And if that bias is zero, that's usually what you want. Is a right? You you don't want to make biased measurements, right? Is that good enough? Okay. Then the other thing you can talk about is the is the variance of theta hat given theta, which is just equal to you know the expectation again of so you know yeah whatever uh, of p of x given theta of what you have theta hat. Uh, uh, minus theta squared, or, uh, sorry, theta, sorry, no, 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 um, sorry, the, the variance is around the, okay, sorry, 
I have to do this again. Uh, of uh, theta hat given theta, okay, too many of these things, right? Uh, squared, uh, bracket. Okay, so you're saying uh, you need to find the, the average value of your estimate, and then you look to see how different theta you know, is from the average value, square it up, and that's how, what you want. So the, the variance is measuring the width of this thing, and it doesn't depend on if it's biased or not, right? Is that fine? And then the other one that people talk about is the mean squared error of, uh, of theta hat given theta, which is that I'm not going to bother writing it, uh, of, of uh, uh, theta hat minus the true value of theta, not the, the average value, squared. Okay, and that uh, decomposes as the variance plus the uh, bias squared. Okay? That's just some, you know, that's just some algebra. Okay, so the mean squared error is basically how different is the estimated value from the true one, you know, on average. This is uh, how much does it fluctuate around its, its average, and then, you know, how different is it from the, the true value. Okay. Okay, so these are things you can write out just generally about estimators, right? I haven't told you how to do it. Now what you can do is come up with different different procedures for estimating, you know, different, uh, th this theta hat of x functions, right? You can come up with different ones, and then you can compare them and see how well they work, right? And in the same way that when I did the Nyman-Pearson setup, I didn't first tell you how to do the test. I told you what do I want? What properties do I want? And then we try to figure out how to do it, right? So, um, so there's, there's uh, now you can imagine that, uh, Say this is like estimating some cosmological parameter, or it's like estimating the you know some uh, Lagrangian parameter of the of some theory. People spend a lot of time trying to come up with the most precise estimates, right? So typically, what people want is like I don't want it to be biased. I want it to be an unbiased estimator, and then I want to try to make the variance be as small as possible, right? That's like a very natural thing to try to do, um, and so. You, you know, you might imagine that you and your colleagues uh, end up having, uh, you write a paper with your great way of estimating this parameter, and then someone else writes uh, a paper that works a little bit better than yours, and then you work harder, and you make one that's better than theirs, and you get into some kind of arms race of, of uh, theta hat estimators, and like, uh, and you might wonder, like, is there is there any end in sight, right? Um, so it turns out there is a fundamental limit of how well you theta hat. And so it's good to know. Um, so uh, this is called the uh, the uh, Kramer no relation or spelling uh, Rao bound, um, and it says that uh, uh, for an uh, unbiased uh, estimator, um, that the uh, that the variance of uh, theta hat given theta is greater than or equal to uh, i, um, you know, the uh, of uh, theta. Okay, and and uh, and so the and what is it? So what's i? Um, um, this is what's called the this is what's called the the Fisher information. Um, Okay, and uh, and if and also if you this is the this is the univariate one where theta is just like has one value. If you if you wanted, there's also a a, a, a multivariate version of the covariance. If you have of theta given uh, theta for, for the ijth component is uh, bigger than or equal to uh, i minus one ij of theta. Okay. Okay, so this is, this is some I sub IJ is some matrix. It's called the Fisher information matrix. You take the inverse of that, um, and, uh, the, you know, the IJth component of that is going to be, you know, uh, you have this bound for the, the IJth component. Okay. Um, so, so uh, yeah, so what, what is this I? Uh, let me write it down, the, uh, the matrix version of it, because the 1D version is just a special case. Uh, this is equal to the expectation of of uh, um, 
of x from p, you know, x given theta, okay? Um, so you're, this is where the param, like when you specify this parameter, it's being specified by, you know, this, this value of theta, okay? Um, or of, of the following quantity, you have d by d theta i of the log of the likelihood function um, uh, times d by d theta j, the log of the likelihood function again. Okay, and, and sometimes I guess I could also write it, you know, instead of writing it like this, I could write it like that. So more consistently with the way that I did it here. So the idea is that oh, you go to some particular value of your, of your parameter space, if that were the true value, uh, then you, you know, that's what's meant by over here on the right side. You're, you're specifying the value of theta. You're generating data according to this model. And for each of those possible data sets, you stick in, you imagine sticking in the data here. And then you have a like, you know, now the data is fixed. You have a likelihood function as a function of theta. And you take, you know, the derivative of the log likelihood along the two different directions. Okay. And, uh, you need with some, uh, Regularity conditions, which are almost always satisfied, then this is also equal to minus uh, the expectation of the second derivative, d theta i d theta j of log of uh, p of x given theta, um, given theta. Okay, so this is just, uh, so what this is saying is that you imagine this, is the, this value of theta is the true one, you generate a bunch of data, you get a bunch of uh, log likelihood curves, um, and you have a minus here, so it's been flipped around. So this is, you know, you have a log likelihood curves that look like this. So here's the theta direction, um, and you're basically looking at the curvature uh, around, you know, the curvature of this thing. Um, and uh, so this, this thing right here is called the Fisher Information Matrix, and what it does, which is pretty amazing, is it says that you, the curvature of this thing says it uh, sets a bound on how well you can measure this parameter. You can't do better than that. Um, and so it's a really fundamental limit of how well you can, you can do. Um, and so then you can talk about, can I come up with a, a, a theta hat uh, that approaches this bound? And, um, and that's, in general, is very hard to do, okay? Um, uh, but <clears throat> there is a particular way of estimating um, uh, the parameters, which is kind of a generic way, you know, that's not like handcrafted for your particular example. Um, anyone want to guess the name of a something something estimate that you may have heard of? Maybe not. So there's something called the maximum likelihood estimate. Um, so uh, theta hat maximum likelihood, you know, uh, of x, is it just equal to uh, the arg max theta of, of uh, you know, p of x given theta. So that, that, that's all. So you, you have some data, x, you plug it into here, and you find the, uh, you find the value of theta that maximizes this likelihood. So it's a very straightforward thing. This is equal to, you know, arg min of theta of uh, minus the log of p of x given theta. And this is what, in practice, people usually do. Usually you have a, a likelihood function. You do the, you, you, the log likelihood, because especially if you have a lot of independent data, if you multiply a bunch of small numbers together, you get, you know, zero on a computer. So if you add together a bunch of small numbers, that and then uh, and then you put a minus sign, uh, you know, and then you minimize it with anyway, you know. So that's like a so when people talk about maximum likelihood fits, this is what they're doing, right? So this is just one particular type. Uh, but what you can show is that uh, is that quote uh, asymptotically uh, um, uh, that that the uh, that theta hat MLE uh, is, uh, uh, you know, uh, is, uh, you know, whatever, how do you want to say it, saturates um, the bound, okay. Um, 
And so, or, or the, the other way that people say it is that uh, theta hat maximum likelihood estimator is uh, uh, asymptotically uh, efficient. Um, and uh, it's also unbiased, asymptotic. Okay. Okay, so what it means to say that it's, uh, that it's unbiased is that, um, it is that, oh, sorry, we know what it, unbiased mean efficient just means that it saturates this bound. You know, the less, you know, the greater than equal turns into an equal sign and asymptotically means that in the limit of lots of data. So this, this thing right here, uh, asymptotically, uh, it's a sort of limit of lots of data, okay? So that's in particular when you think about you have a, a bunch of XIs that are drawn from P of X given theta and that are uh, I, I, D, this independent and identically distributed, and you have like N of them as N gets large. Uh, you'll estimate the true value and it will be unbiased and it will be the best estimate you can hope for. Okay, so that's a, because of that, um, that's not true if you have small numbers of events. Uh, but if you have small numbers of events, you'd have to come up with kind of a customized estimator. But if you think you're gonna have a fair amount of data, then you can kind of not sweat it and just use the maximum likelihood estimate and things generally work out pretty well. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, so all of this is, you know, I'm, I'm sort of working within the context of, of a model, right? And so, um, you know, I talked earlier about a few different ways that we came up with P of X given theta, but there's a whole bunch of different ways of coming up with a model. And that's why I kind of try to divide uh, in the way that I present it into two parts. One is the statistical modeling, like how do you come up with P of X given theta? And then once you have P of X given theta, there's like the downstream statistics part where I can just write it out and not really sweat where it came from, right? So, um, and that's also why I was saying that in some sense as a physicist, the most important thing is to work on the statistical modeling side uh, because, uh, you know, that's where the, all the physics sits, right? Okay. Um, okay, and then, um, so there's one last thing to say and then, uh, and then we'll be done. So if you have, say that you have this, uh, you know, this data set that goes from I equals one to, to N, okay? So you have a bunch of data like this. How would you actually go about finding this maximum likelihood estimate, right? You would say you would have a sum, you have like minus the sum of log of P of XI given theta, and you have I equals one to N, right? And then you would, that, th this would be your total likelihood function and you would scan theta and find the value that minimizes it. Yeah? So that's pretty easy going. Um, now, now the, what I want to do is try to kind of end with where we started at the beginning of this lecture. Uh, when is, when I, I started off by writing this, this, uh, this expected risk function and in general writing uh, the ex you know, these kinds of you know, expectation of something, some integrand, was what? It, it looked like an integral of this and whatever the integrand was, and then we could approximate that with a Monte Carlo integral, right? Right? And when you do that approximation where it's like a sum, one over n and the sum of evaluating the integrand, right? Do, do, you, do, do I need to write it out again? The, uh, um, you, can work out the, you can work that thing in the opposite direction, right? So this would be the integrand, Right? And this, this thing, if I put like, you know, one over N in front or something like that, you know, this would be the, the, that expectation, right? And so, you know, the minimum of this isn't gonna change if I put one over N in front of it, right? So I can make a, like that, right? You see what I'm getting at? So wh what would the, if I work the other direction and I think of this as an empirical kind of Monte Carlo style approximation of something, what would it be an approximation of? It's like an expectation, right? It's gonna be an, or an integral. I don't know if you have a preferred way for me to write it. It's gonna be an expectation of this integrand, right? Of P of X given theta. Oh, sorry, log, well, yeah, minus log, sorry. Minus log 
uh, p of x given theta. Yeah? But what is the... But down here, I need to specify the distribution that it's an expectation with respect to. What is the, what is it a, uh, what distribution is it? Right, if I wanted, I could write integral of some distribution times this, right? But what distribution is it? Yeah, so that's what you would think, because when I wrote this, like when I wrote bias here, I wrote given theta. There's another way I could write it where I wrote specifically what the distribution was down here. And that's, that was the distribution that was there, right? And this was the thing that's like approximately equal to one over n sum, you know, in this case, theta hat of x. But I always have to put in parentheses down here what the date, you know, this is xi, right? Um, this is, in, in parentheses I put down here that what, that the xi are distributed according to some distribution. And the distribution, they're, they're, they're distributed according to whatever this thing is, right? So in this case, it was, P of X given theta, right? But it can't be P of X given theta here because I'm gonna be scanning theta, right? Theta is gonna be changing, but the data is not changing, right? The data is fixed. So distribution goes here, right? So imagine that like you're doing this at the LHC, I'm trying to fit the Higgs boson mass. This is my statistical model for what those distributions look like. I have actual data, right? What is the source of the distribution? It's like whatever nature is, right? It's like the true distribution. It's the data generating distribution. I don't know what, what, what it is, but symbolically I can kind of reverse engineer this thing of, and think of it as you know, P true or something like that you know, of X. You know? So it's like X given P true of X, right? Um, and so this is kind of interesting because you can think of, now you can think of the, the sampling of data at the LHC as like sampling some true unknown data distribution in the sky. Um, and I'm calculating this. And this was a quantity that Gilles introduced. I don't know if you remember it. So he wrote it as an expectation of P, you know, P of X given uh, minus log of uh, Q of X, right? And this was the thing that he called, this was the, uh, the cross entropy, I don't remember how you wrote it, H or something, uh, H of, was it P given, yeah, P given Q. Um, right. So I guess what I'm getting at is that minimizing the cross entropy between the like true data distribution and your, your statistical model try, is the same as doing a maximum likelihood fit. And the, and the other version here that I can write is something called a DKL of P given Q, which is basically just the same thing. It's that same expectation of, you know, given P of a minus log uh, Q, uh, uh, and then, and then the, with the other sign, you know, plus expectation of P um, time, or I can see minus here and minus again, whatever. Uh, log um, uh, P again. So this thing is called the, if I'm doing an optimization, this is just a constant that doesn't involve the Q or the P of X given theta at all. So this would just be a constant. This would be the same as this term, right? And so, uh, so this thing called the KL, this is called the coolback liebler divergence. And it's something you see all over the place. And, and it's like a distance measure between the distribution P and the distribution Q. Okay, and that's how you calculate it. It's not symmetric. If you switch P and Q, it's not the same thing anymore. Um, but uh, if P equals Q, then you get zero. So like, you know, if the, if the distributions match exactly, then it's zero. And so then you can think about like a, a fit, this is my last statement, is that if you think about a fit where you have, uh, um, you know, like a histogram, you know, your, your histogram data, if you ever get a fit that looks kind of like this and it goes right through it, you're basically bringing the statistical model, the kind of Q, the P of X given theta, to look just like the real data distribution, which is like P true, and you're making that, that distance be zero. Like at the beginning of your fit, if it looked like, you know, your function was something very different, that those, that distance measure would be very different, you know, very large. 
but as the fit proceeds, they start to be uh, very similar to each other. So this distance is very small, or this cross entropy is minimized, or it's the equivalent to doing a maximum likelihood fit. So these are all basically the same thing said in different languages. But in machine learning, you see cross entropy uh, and, uh, and, uh, and the KL distance all over the place. So that's why I wanted to kind of end with that. Um, and, that and basically that if you hear them, you can kind of think maximum likelihood in the back of your mind. Okay. I'm done. Okay. Um, so it was, well, if anyone wants to ask questions, go for it. 